Welcome to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman, the podcast dedicated to helping you build the business of your dreams and live the life you always hoped for with valuable and fun tips and info to make your life easier and more fun. And now, here's your host, a man who sprinkles metal shavings on his breakfast cereal just for fun, Jason Silverman. And welcome to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. I'm your host, Jason Silverman, and I'm thrilled to share some time with you again today. As you know, I'm always on the hunt for interesting as well as super smart Real Deal guests, and i got to tell you, today's show is a winner. I want to introduce my listeners to somebody who's truly been there and done that, and I'm excited to pick his brain for your benefit and, you know, secretly for my own benefit as well. Now, for the folks who I work with in any of my coaching programs, uh, Power Forwards Character Development, All-Star Cheer Sites, or the Jason's Army Mastermind Group... You know how much I focus on being an effective and persuasive communicator, right? Well, the show is going to help us to do just that. So today it's going to be my honor and privilege to share an amazing resource with you. You're going to love today's guest. He's got a ton of valuable info about what I consider to be one of the keys to success. So I want you to strap yourself in. Today's show is going to be a blast. As I'm sure you already know, I'm committed to helping business owners just like you to become more successful, enjoy your career more, and in general, make your life significantly more fun. We only get one ride on this merry-go-round, and uh, we want to make sure it's one hell of a ride, right? Alrighty, boys and girls, it is now that time. I want you to stop surfing Facebook, put away your phone, your tablet, your dog, your cat, your spouse, your child, anything that might possibly distract you from today's show. You're about to get some great and immediately implementable information, and I don't want you to miss even a second of it. So, before we officially get going, let me give you a little bit of background about our special guest expert today. Jordan Harmiger is a Wall Street lawyer turned talk show host, social dynamics expert, and entrepreneur. He's the owner and co-founder of The Art of Charm, a consulting and coaching company, as well as a top 50 podcast on iTunes, which he's been hosting for over a decade. Jordan's company, The Art of Charm, holds boot camps and training sessions, companies and individuals that want to learn the elements of emotional intelligence to become more persuasive, more confident, and more charismatic. Jordan, welcome to The Real Deal. I'm thrilled to have you today. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Ah, pleasure is mine. Listen, before we get started, for those who haven't yet had the opportunity and pleasure of meeting you or hearing you speak or listening to your podcast yet, take a second, if you would, share your story with our listeners. What are you passionate about? What makes you tick? Um, I like running my show, The Art of Charm. I've been doing that for 10 years, and it's awesome that it's it's uh, it's awesome I get to call this my job slash work. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. So tell me a little bit about um, going through and understanding persuasion. You know, for, for many of the folks who are my listeners, um, we work in the after-school activity world. So I believe, you know, as a coach or as an owner – Persuasion plays its part. How, do, how does somebody get started in becoming more persuasive? Well, it, it comes down to knowing – actually, you know, there's a lot of fancy explanations for this one. But I would say it comes down to knowing people's intentions or at least becoming aware of people's intentions and then being aware – of how you filter them. And most people can't do both of these things, let alone do both of them well. Most people can't do either of these things, I should say, let alone be able to do them well. So what I mean is, here's a simple experiment that most people never do. And and I I think women are better at this than men, but I still think there's a lot of room for growth in, in both genders, both sexes. If you are able to figure out why someone is saying what they are saying, with some degree of certainty, you'll have a huge advantage. And so what this means, and of course, we can never be 100% with this. Uh, Parents are really good at doing it with their kids. But if we're good at doing this with, with just about anybody, we have a huge advantage in life. And so what we can do is we can figure out why people are saying what they're saying and get maybe three or four options on the table. For example, if I say, nice hair. Right. That's a really obvious, convenient example because it can mean several different things. But we see this when people say just about anything such as, oh, it's going to be tight for me to get there at five o'clock tomorrow. Right. Are they saying I don't want to go at all because it's going to be annoying for me to get there? Are they saying I don't want to go at all because they don't want to go at all for some other reason? Are they saying I might be late? There's a lot of things people are saying, but we don't really know. So we can only come up with hypotheses, right, like scientists. And then we have to be aware of the other thing that influences 
our perception, which is our own emotional filters. And what I mean by this is, for example, if I say, and well, let's go back to the nice hair example, the really easy one. If I say nice hair, Jason, you might say thanks, or you might say, you know, go fly a kite, Jordan, depending on what you think that means, exactly. right? So it's not my intention behind it. It's a combination of your perception of my intention plus your current emotional state. Because if, if you say go fly a kite, Jordan, what you assume my intention is is sarcasm that I hate your hair. But if you had come across that same comment and you were in a good, confident state of mind, you would just think, ah, Jordan, he's always got a smart mouth on him. It's part of his charm or whatever. But if you're in a bad mood for some other reason, you might say, you know, I don't even know why I put up with this guy. He is so annoying. Look at him. Oh, nice hair, Jason. Right? You You would react that same way. And I don't know you that well, but let's assume that both of those are valid outcomes depending on what mood you're in, right, as they would be for me. Yep. You have to be aware of that because what happens with our perception and our influence and when it comes to these things is we think that whatever our perception of someone else's intention is, is fact, and we usually just pick one. And usually that that determination is also clouded by our emotional filter. So... That emotional filter, in other words, what state of mind you're in, essentially directs the needle towards what you assume I meant, which then becomes the fact in your mind of what I actually meant. Neither of those things are necessarily true. They're all subjective. And yet we as humans are kind of wired to go, well, my initial gut reaction says this, and my gut reaction is influenced by the fact that I just dropped a can of pickles on the ground and I have to clean it up, so I hate you now, right? <laughs> I mean, that happens all the time. That happens all the time. And we don't notice those processes in action, so we just accept them as fact because they're our own thoughts. Hmm. Okay. So obviously, you know, it, it gets back to it's all about us. Um, how do we, uh, like understanding that, you know, obviously it's, it's our perception of what you're saying. How do we actually, how do we get control of that? Because especially, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the owners who are working with, you know, 12 to 17 year old girls and they've got 300 of them coming in a night. Um, how do they, how do they get control of that so that it's not a snark? It's not snarkiness is not the first option. Right. So the problem is that teenagers in general or young people with less life experience, I should say, who are more emotional, their emotional filters are going to be much stronger. So they're, they're never even going to, for one second, most likely give you any kind of benefit of the doubt. They're just going to listen to their own emotional filter. So if we can get those people laughing, having fun, feeling relaxed from the day's stress at school, especially depending on how old the kids are. If they're really young, that's one thing. But teenagers have all kinds of pressure, as you know, uh, just dealing with them all the time. That pressure that's very real, and to them is the end of the world, even though for us we remember that not being a big deal. At the time, it was life or death, right? Social stuff. What did Janelle say about your skirt today? That stuff matters. So we have to, what we would call it art of charm, pump their emotional state. And so we have to break patterns about what they're currently thinking about. If they're stressed out about school, we have to get them out of their head and get them moving around is a good way to do this, especially if you run a dance studio and things like that. You probably are, or some sort of cheer group or, or even a karate studio, you know that it's the begin, and I'm making an assumption here, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say the beginning is the toughest part of class. But once people get into the swing of things, they're in the swing of things. They're doing it, right? There's only a few outliers where someone's got a lot of stress or has a really bad attitude that things are going to cause a problem. But I would imagine that in the beginning, there's a lot of inertia that you have to get over. And the quicker you can get people moving around, it's harder for them to think logically about something when they're moving around because they've got to use different faculties. So sure, people can be distracted, but it's harder. They actually almost have to try to, or something has to really take precedence. So getting people moving around, warmed up, get some endorphins going to change their emotional state, that will make a huge difference. And this is probably not news to anybody who runs an act a studio that has any kind of physical activity in the beginning. No, absolutely. You know, emotion creates emotion. So that, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. So you talked about, you know, pattern breaks. Aside from getting them moving, what other kind of pattern breaks, um, you know, can you suggest one or two that somebody can actually implement when they feel that already that, you know, that, that energy level is, is weird? 
Sure. So I want to go back to what you just said, which is motion creates emotion. It doesn't just create emotion. It changes and uh, and focuses emotion. So if somebody's really stressed out about a test and something that somebody else said to them at school, they can then focus that emotion on something else, such as that activity. So it doesn't just create emotion. The emotion is already there. These people are already feeling, teenagers are, as you know, just powder kegs of emotion. So it's not that we need to get them emotional. It's that we need to figure out how to get all of their emotions which are essentially just a a herd of cats and get them all running in one direction. And so I think that's important to notice because a lot of folks think it's easy to get this stuff clouded into clever bumper stickers, then go, wait, but how do I use this, right? Um, And to, to your next question, how do we use this? Sure, getting people moving around is great. Also, if somebody's really distracted about something, and maybe you all have decided that this isn't your job, but I think if somebody's really distracted, sad, or upset about something, it maybe is a great idea for you to pull them aside and talk about it or have an assistant take over class so that you can do that or have an assistant pull them aside and talk about somebody who's sensitive to that kind of situation because I don't think it's good for people, especially kids, to not deal with serious stuff at all and just to distract themselves. And so I think hashing something out and making somebody feel better will help them focus more on the task at hand if it's really urgent and you'll soon be able to sort out the drama queens from the people who really have something going on at home and so i i want to point that out because i think it's easy for after school activities teachers to be like ah this is not my problem just do the friggin you know karate six or do the jumping jacks and shut up and go tell your parents because there's a good chance that that same kid can't tell their parents about what they're going through. They're just not. They're alone. Or or their parents aren't going to understand. Their parents don't get home till 7, and that's why you've got them in the first place, right? So there's a lot of things that you can do that maybe aren't your job, but that might actually be the most important part of your job. Uh, So I wanted to to note that. Getting them moving around, getting them to hash, uh, hash out or discuss the issue at hand, both of those are great ways to to let the steam valve loose a little bit. And I don't know of any other sort of magic tricks. There are no real Jedi tricks to getting kids to forget about something other than focus their energy, their energy elsewhere or help diffuse it a little bit by talking the, the problem out a little bit. And you don't have to solve it. You can just let them know that somebody else has heard them and maybe doesn't think it's that big of a deal, not minimalizing it, but, but says, look, you're, you're going to get through this. It's fine. You know, nobody's going to remember this in a few weeks or, you know, this isn't the end of the world or that same thing happened to me when I was reading. Fine. Right. I'm employed gainfully. You know, there's a lot of things that kids think is the end of the world, which has no bearing in one week. But at the time, their emotions are running so strong, they can't help but think that it does. That makes a lot of sense. I, I want to switch gears a little bit, um, but stay on the exact same track. So, you know, from an owner's perspective, um, whether they're talking about staff or now dealing with prospective members or client, prospective clients, um, I guess we can't force them to run around. So as far as creating the, um, the pattern breaks there to actually get ourselves back into the game to be either able to close the sale or to get your staff back in line, um, how, do we, how, do we look at, um, how do we look at persuasion from that perspective? Can you give me an example? Because without context, I'm, I'm a little bit – I don't sure. want to answer the question no, no, here. Absolutely. So it's two different points. So number one, it would be, all right, I actually need to persuade my staff to – um, do the things they don't necessarily see value in that I understand that there's value in. Uh, and it might be, hey, go clean the bathrooms because it's your job. How do I persuade them to do that is one side. Um, and obviously feeling whatever sort of friction or pushback they're going to get from a typical staff member would be the first side. And then really just the other side of it from a prospecting side is how do I deal with you know somebody who probably wants to join. Um, I know I need to persuade them and get them over the hump because they're showing me 47 47 different objections that I know none of them are really real. Sure. So one is a sales question and the other one is essentially a sales question in disguise. Correct. A management. So we'll start with the management thing. I mean, this is really tough because essentially your employees should know And you might have to decide to to show them that doing menial tasks like cleaning the bathroom, these are things that, these are things that you need to 
to show them are a part of a bigger picture because nobody just wants to be the guy who cleans the bathroom all the time, right? It has to be part of a bigger picture. Look, we're taking care of these kids. If they were yours, you wouldn't want them in this dirty bathroom. Spreading the germs around is really bad. It's for, bad for us as well, so we got to make sure that it's clean in there because, you know, these kids are, are pretty dirty and they're not going to stay clean themselves, that kind of thing. And then also, yeah, you know, I, I nobody loves cleaning the bathroom, but uh, it's part of the leadership of the company, and we all do it from time to time. That way they don't see this as, ugh, I'm the low man on the total pole. This is what I have to do, and I'm going to mail it in. Rather, this is part of me taking care of my students. It's part of me taking care of the school. It's part of me taking care of the the, the company here, and it's a part, uh, it's a stepping stone to more responsibility. And that's kind of what we do at AOC as well. I mean, sure, it's maybe you're not cleaning bathrooms, but maybe you're doing menial planning later, sticking around to make sure people get in the house, in the office, you're managing the office, keeping things clean, et cetera. Not a glamorous job, but it's all a part of taking care of our AOC clients, making sure things run on time, saving everybody else time. It's an integral part of the business, and we make those people feel that way, not just, well, you're new here, so you get to wash all the dishes. That's that's not how we roll. Uh, as far as your sales question is concerned, it's probably a, a question that's better set for somebody who's an expert in, in B2C sales, but you have to look at the objections and then find out what the real objection behind it is because chances are it, it's always they always come down to money or time, and those objections always get handled the same way. So it's not just, well, this place is a little far, so it's hard for me to get him here on time from school, and so da da da. It's there's always something that can be done to accommodate this. Uh, however, you have to decide as to whether or not those those objections are real. I mean, if it really is too far for them to get them from school, maybe they can hitch a ride from someone else. I mean, we really have to solve some of these problems for them, but we also have to figure out what the real objection is. Because if the objection is, I hate driving in traffic, that's different than it's going to be hard to get him here on time. Or, well, it's a little expensive is different than I've got two kids here, so the cost is prohibitively high. However, I'm sending my other kids to this more expensive thing that I see more value in. So it becomes a value question, right, as opposed to it's just too much money. I mean, you've probably heard, well, this is a little expensive from kids' parents who are freaking like surgeons or something, and you're thinking, you spent more on dinner yesterday than a month of karate classes for this kid. What are you talking about? It's too expensive. They just don't see the value. So you don't want to come down on price because you haven't solved the value problem. You've only solved the what you what they told you they think the problem is and they're wrong um again same thing with well he doesn't have time he's doing a lot of other things it's it's mostly going to be value there's going to be some fault in the value so that saves owners like you a lot of money because instead of saying well i'll discount you 50 bucks and then you're basically breaking even with this one student instead of that you're going oh well you know what i throw in the the initial uniform which probably costs you like 15 bucks to get one of those like thin karate geese that they're going to start off with. And they go, oh, good, yeah, good, because he just outgrew his last one. Or, oh, yeah, we were just going to borrow one, but our friend's is disgusting and has blood stains on it, so I don't want that. Right? You can add to the value in that way to show that you care without discounting the price. Or you can say, look, I know that you that the other karate schools are cheaper, but they pack like 30 kids in those classes. I want to pay attention to what these kids are doing, make sure they're doing the work, make sure they're having fun while they're doing it that's the value and people almost never address that stuff they only address well i guess i can lower it down 25 bucks what do you say doc and then they go well i don't know because you haven't addressed the value issue so you got to make sure the objection you're handling is the objection that they have i love that this is fabulous all right i want to hear more about the art of charm so tell me what it is uh tell me who you help um and tell me how it started Sure. So The Art of Charm is both a show and a school. If you go to theartofcharm.com or if so you're listening to a podcast right now, so if you wherever you search for your podcasts, you can search for The Art of Charm and you'll find us there. And basically, I get to ask smart people questions all day. Uh, Tim Ferriss, Seth Godin, Gary Vaynerchuk, Tony Hawk. I just had an astronaut, Mike Massimino, on here. Uh, I have a lot of really, really sharp people, producers and and just genius writers, things like that. And I get to ask them questions and they get to dissect or I get to dissect their mindset for the audience. And so I talk with uh, the producer of Billions on Showtime. He wrote Rounders, host of Slate's podcast. I'll ask him things about 
how creative work works, how essentially there's a line between being an artist and being delusional. Uh, and a lot of the tactics that we talked about today, persuasion, influence, networking, negotiation skills, all of that stuff, uh, I talk about on the Utter Charm. And the school that we have is in L.A. We got people coming from all over the world to stay there for five days, and they learn all of the skills that we teach on the show in person. So starting conversations, networking, relationship development. Um, we get a lot of single guys. We get a lot of divorced guys. We get a lot of married guys in there. And we talk about things, subjects that most men won't open up to. And right now that program is for men only in L.A. The residential program is we have a separate program for women simply because getting guys to open up about the stuff that matters can be really tricky. So it's significantly similar to what we discussed here today and different enough in terms of we go a lot deeper and we personalize the content for each particular guy. So the Art of Trauma is essentially a school as well as a show just like this one. Wild. Wild. How long has it been around? Ten years. That is fabulous. All right. So tell me this. It's time for our resource of the week. How can our folks find out more about you and how you're basically helping the world get better one person at a time? I would say you're already listening to a podcast. Just go into iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you're listening to shows and search for The Art of Charm and you'll find us. Fabulous. 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 And I also believe on our show notes, you've got the, uh, theartofcharm.com slash social, correct? That's right. Perfect. All right. So I always like to end my podcast with one important question. So if you could give business owners just one solid piece of advice to either help their business or more importantly, help them to live a better, more balanced life, what would that piece of advice be? I would say focus on making small incremental improvements. And I think a lot of us, we get caught up in, I don't have time to read because I'm always doing this, or I don't have time to work out because I'm always doing that. And I always try to focus on small ways to use my own psychology to help me improve. For example, I go to bed earlier, not just because I've mustered up the willpower to go to bed earlier, but because I leave my blue light blocking sunglasses, which, you know, the blue light from your phone and computer and TV keep you up later than it should. I keep those glasses on top of the iPad or in front of the TV where I'm going to go watch a movie, and I put them on during that. That causes me to get sleepy earlier, which causes me to go to bed earlier, which causes me to get more sleep and be able to wake up earlier, which lets me wake up early and go to the gym or wait, lets me wake up early and go study Chinese, which is something that I'm studying as well. And, oh, I don't have time to read. True. I, drew, I do drive a lot, though, so why don't I start getting audiobooks from Audible? Basically, you start to fix the little things and little increments that start to tighten up the ship. Instead of saying, oh, yeah, I'll read that book when I have a three-day free period, which is never, especially if you have kids, it's never going to happen, you can read a book every week or two, depending on how much time you spend in the car, but you're probably not doing that because you think, oh, well, it's so hard to do da No, you really need to muster up just a slight amount of willpower. Uh, for example... Instead of saying, I'm going to go to the gym or go run every morning, what I did when I was starting to learn to run was I said, I'm just going to get out of bed and put on my workout gear. And then after that, if I'm tired, I'll just be go back to bed. And that was such a small hurdle for me to get over that what I was able to do is get up, put all my workout stuff on, and then very rarely, but I still did, go back to sleep a couple of times just because I really needed to sleep. But mostly what happened was I went, all right. I put on my shoes and I put on my workout gear. I'm just going to go to the gym. And if you can't get that leap, then you make another incremental step, such as, well, I'm just going to put on my workout gear, go outside, after, or make coffee and go outside. And then if I want to go back in and go to sleep, I can do that. How many times do you think I got up, put on my workout gear, made coffee, stepped outside for a run, and then went up back stairs and, and went to sleep? Not that often. But I'll tell you, when I told myself, oh, I got to get up at 6 a.m. and run three miles, that was a lot less frequent because the bar was higher. So just use your own psychology against you and use these little incremental improvements, and you will find that you're able to change your psychology that much easier. I love it. I'll be starting that tonight. Jordan, thank you so much for joining me today. I know how busy your schedule is, so it means a world that you share some of your time and a whole bunch of your wisdom with me and my listeners. Thank you. You got it. Thank you. Folks, that's all the time we've got today. Thanks so much for tuning into The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. For more info about private coaching or to see if you benefit from one of my mastermind groups, visit me over at www.jasonmsilverman.com. I look forward to helping you achieve the success that you truly deserve. Until next time, let me leave you with this. Get out there and be the real deal. Set a goal, make a plan, work like hell towards it, and achieve the success that's waiting for you. Now's the time. Get out there and make it happen. This has been Jason Silverman, and I hope you have a spectacular week. 
You've been listening to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. To access the great resources mentioned in the show and for information on coaching and mastermind group opportunities with Jason, please visit jasonmsilverman.com.